Thanks, Tim. Great to be here uh, again. Um, I think it's been six months, almost the day, actually, um, since I last spoke to uh, the Share Cafe um, platform. And uh, very shortly thereafter, the um, company got thrown a bit of a curveball. Um, we went into a bit of a huddle, um, doing a lot of work uh, with our consultants and actually with the government and the EPA. I'm very pleased to say that we've, we've emerged from that. Um, we've got a stronger project, a more financeable project. And I'm here to talk to you today about our final pathway through approvals and into uh, construction. So let's flip over. Um, yeah, next one. Uh, that's good. So exec sum. I'm actually going to talk through most of these points um, later on in the presentation. The thing um, for TNG, we're developing the Mount Peak Mine um, and Processing Hub. That is basically in the middle of Australia, um, sort of in the Southern Northern Territory, um, very close to existing infrastructure. Um, We'll go through these highlights in a second. The thing I'm going to talk to now, so I'll just pick out a few points on each slide, is the bottom one, which is green energy. Um, we've been making a lot of noise um, around our green hydrogen and green energy strategy. Um, and I've seen on investor forums, and there's been a few questions to say, well, geez, you know, don't quite get it. Is it a distraction? The company should be focusing on development of Mount Peak. And what I want to sort of highlight and explain it, I guess, in layman's terms is, is green energy is not a distraction. Green hydrogen is absolutely core to us being able to develop Mount Peak. And um, let me explain why. So the NT has got its act together um, and it's actually uh, delivered a uh, net zero by 2050 target. Uh, could even come in before that. Um, obviously, the feds may do something similar we expect soon. Um, and so... When we look at our project, we will be in operation still by 2050 because we're a multi-generational, really long life asset. Um, and so when the government is looking and saying, hey, is, are these the guys that we want to develop a project in the territory? Um, they want to go, how will this project affect our target for a uh, net zero by 2050? And so what we are doing through our green hydrogen strategy is demonstrating that we're really thinking about this. There's a lot of strategy behind it. And we are absolutely the type of people that you want to deliver to develop a project in the territory. So I guess in the short term, green energy and green hydrogen for us, it really de-risks the final approvals pathway. Step forward again and then go, okay, well, in the medium term, green energy um, and, and green hydrogen and uh, you know, ESG credentials, um, they're extremely important for financing a project these days. When you look at the, the government concessional lenders, so you know, NAIF, um, CEFC, uh, EFA, very, very important to have those credentials. One step further, commercial banks, well, there's an absolute truckload of money available in green loans these days. They're buckets of money that you don't want to avoid, let me tell you. Um, again, when we step into equity and you look at ethical investment funds and, and, and sort of impact investing, um, the, the, the focus of, of the, the, the footprint, the carbon footprint on the, on the projects, is extremely important. And even when we're now getting down into retail, um, you know, we can't avoid um, addressing and being at the forefront of green energy. So hopefully that's a bit of an explanation about why you've seen a focus on it from the company. Um, and it's certainly not just a, just a distraction. So as we go over the next slide um, and we give a bit more information on Mount Peak, um, the, the change that we've sort of announced recently is that we've got a consolidated project now where we'll do, we're doing processing um, and mining down at Mount Peak. Um, that comes with all sorts of benefits, which I can run through in a second. Um, the project is underwritten by the um, TNG's Taiwan, which is a um, patented um, uh, technology, which I'll explain. We've got all sorts of, uh, you know, government, approval, uh, government approvals, government major project statuses, a lot of support there from the Critical Minerals Facilitation Office and others. Um, and from a mining perspective, look, we're not, we're really actually not going to be a mining project. It's such a large, flat, easy to mine at surface or, or body um, that um, really we see ourselves as a mineral, minerals processing company, not a mining company. Um, let's flip over to the next page then. Um, so we take one ore body, titanium magnetite, we produce three products. And the key to that is our Taiwan process. The, the critical thing about the three products is they are all produced at quality, which is bench, above benchmark. Um, that's important for two reasons. One, you get more money for it. And secondly, it ensures that you can go into the broadest range of end use markets, um, particularly important in V, because um, if you only produce at benchmark V, you can't actually get into the really attractive um, vanadium electrolyte businesses. Um, next slide. And, and, and this, is, this is actually, this is the crux of our presentation today. On the left is the conventional process that you usually use to produce vanadium from a titanium magnetite. 
that's 80 year old technology. And what it does is it takes one thing, V, um, and, it, and it throws away the titanium in the iron, which is actually about 80% of the value. Now, it's 80, 80 years old. And look, I should know because I was the one who financed the last V project that got up in Australia using that tech. It's, it's old, uh, it's inefficient. Um, from a, I, I, it's, a it's, it's, it's from an automotive perspective, it's your old gas guzzler. You know, doesn't care about the emissions it puts out and doesn't use its fuel efficiently. On the right is Taiwan, which is, is our, our, our proprietary technology. And to take that analogy further, this is the Tesla of minerals processing. Why do I say that? Well, besides the fact that they're both really cool, coolly branded and both start with T, um, Taiwan is, is extremely um, more environmentally friendly and sustainable. It de develop, delivers 100% of the value of the ore as opposed to about 20% from the old tech. It's new technology and it's where the growth will be in this industry. And I'm very strongly of the view um, that whilst there are actually still um, juniors on the ASX trying to get this 80 year old technology up, I don't think a standalone V project using 80 year old technology is the way to go. And I don't think another one will get done in, in Australia. Um, the benefit of having three high quality revenue streams from the one ton of ore is diversification of revenue. So de-risking your financing and your future returns. And secondly, it just passes the pub test, right? You're using all the value of your ore as opposed to only 20% of it. Um, so next slide. We, look, we have a, a robust project. I'm not gonna go into numbers. I just wanna point out a couple of things. The mine life that we say there, well, initially says 37 years, but um, you know, that's because you know, there is an ore body that we've got a jork to find resource on. The useful life of that project um, and the equipment will be longer. We also have satellite ore bodies that we, we are looking at. Um, my expectation is that, you know, this is a multi-generational asset um, and you can certainly extend the life of the, the minerals processing facility um, beyond that initial life. Again, with ore feed at 2 million tonnes per annum, that is a sort of a stage one thing. And these projects are actually quite um, modular. Um, you, could, you could do a two or four or six. Um, and um, that's something that you could look to do as, as you prove up um, the operations of that first project. Um, and, then, and then they're all um, very bankable um, thereafter. Um, the next slide. So what did we do? We optimised, we optimised. We, we were initially planning on putting a processing facility in Darwin. Um, we talked a lot uh, with the Northern Territory government and the EPA. They provided some fantastic advice, really, really helpful, and actually solved a couple of issues for us. And, and funnily enough, when solving those issues, we realised that the project's going to be better off down at the mine site. Um, and that is, we solved the water issue and we solved the gas issue. Um, now, by bringing everything back to the mine site, um, again, without going into numbers and just keeping it at that sort of common sense level, um, there's going to be some, you know, some, some optimizations. Let's run through them. For example, we don't have to build two power stations. We just build one bigger one. Well, I can guarantee you there's, there's efficiencies in scale there. Uh, we don't have to build a rail siding um, up in Darwin. Uh, we don't have to cart ore or concentrate a thousand kilometers up to, to only cart the waste a thousand kilometers down. And almost it, more, most importantly, we're no longer building in a cyclone area. Well, That'll come with sort of the engineering factors on cyclone construction are quite high, so you remove those. And in the long term, you'll actually also have uh, improved availability and operations because you're not, you're not have to worry about that cyclone inclement weather. Um, so we're very, very pleased with all this. And, and the other last point there, which is really interesting, um, this is actually de-risking the approvals pathways because when you look at approvals, you know, the appro environmental approvals are generally driven by sensitive receptors, whether that sensitive receptor be human concern, animal, plant, mineral, whatever. Um, you know, in Darwin, there are more sensitive receptors in the, in the middle of nowhere. Um, there are less sensitive receptors. It makes the pathway easier. Um, and, and finally, the um, being down at the mine site, there are actually a, a lot more opportunities for our Indigenous partners. So we're very pleased uh, with that. On the next slide, when we go to readiness, well, we're in the we're in the final sprint now to, um, to finalise all the, the approvals um, and get into sort of the uh, proper uh, development work. Um, from a regulatory perspective, we are then having to do a bit of extra work down on the mine site. I would note though, we do have a full environmental approval already at the mine site. It's just now got to incorporate um, the processing. So we're not starting from zero. Um, and that's similar with our tenure down there. We've got a mine plan. That mine plan already allows processing. Uh, from a technical perspective, um, 
if anyone knows our site up in Darwin, it was a funny shaped site. It kind of looked like a barbell, big fat thing here, big fat thing here, little skinny bit in the middle, which meant the plant was a bit of a funny shape. Um, we now unconstrained down at the site, so you can make a much more linear kind of efficient plant shape, um, and the engineering is currently happening on that. Um, and from a commercial perspective, well, we've just continued to get tailwinds in terms of the support from the market and government in terms of critical minerals. Um, so the time is right to develop this project. Um, another change on the next slide that we've announced is a, a refinement to the development path. And I think this is a, a case where um, we get to have our cake and eat it too. So we've, we've worked with SMS for a long time. They are fantastic at what they do. And um, part of what really bulletproofs our financing is that we're going to have a process guarantee that sits behind it. So um, that process guarantee will be both product spec and um, throughput based. So if you have an issue, um, hey, there's going to be someone that can fix it. And look, recently there's been a few uh, project developers in on the ASX where they've had those issues. They didn't have process guarantees. We do. The benefit of having Clough in there is that they're Australian. Um, that that, are, that are not so worried about you know trying to get people in through border controls during COVID, and they've got a track record of constructing big projects in Australia in remote areas. So um, yeah, cake and eat it too. It's a brilliant outcome for us. Finally, on our next steps, um, we are, we're pushing through some amendments to a permitting and approvals, um, which is which is good. And we, we're discussing obviously all these additional opportunities that we have with the indigenous uh, groups, um, refinalizing all that um, engineering stuff, all the work we've done before, we can still use most of it. Um, we're now just optimizing layouts and other things, um, and project financing pushes forward. And I you know like to just continue to say the, the, the support you get from the market around critical minerals and the federal government has demonstrated that recently with a $2 billion critical minerals loan fund, which has been administered by EFA. What's interesting about that, it's not actually new money that the government has put, put aside. That money was always there on the national interest account. What the government's saying is, you know, EFA, bugger it, you want to spend that money on critical minerals. And um, from all the critical minerals projects there are in Australia, we're the most advanced. So, um, you know, we want to be front of the line for that. Um, Last point, look, we'll skip through the next couple of slides because they, they're related to green hydrogen. I made a pretty strong point about that at the start. Um, and if we just go on to slide 16, I think, uh, which is why I invest in TNG. Look, hopefully, yep, that one. Hopefully um, I've put forward a case to say this project is going places. It's the right time from a market perspective to do it. Um, and right now there's a bit of a disconnect between our market cap um, and the project value. That has come up a little bit in the last couple of days, I think. We've been marketing a lot in the last few weeks. Um, the MD, uh, Paul Burton, has been out on small caps, um, resources rising stars. Um, I believe there was a Eureka report. I'm here today. We're presenting in the Territory next week. We're now out, able to tell the story about how good this is. Um, and I think the market's responding. That said, there's still a lot more to go. So uh, we look forward to uh, more support from our shareholders in the future. And Tim, over to you. Thanks, uh, Jono. Um... So does the integration of the whole project to kind of one site um, speed up the approvals timetable? Yeah, look, funnily enough, yeah, it, it, it does because, as I said, it actually simplifies the, the final approvals um, and, and it also means you're only constructing, funnily enough, it means you're only constructing on one site as opposed to two. So it'll actually speed up approvals and also, funnily enough, speed up the, the overall construction pathway. Um, so, you know, that that's a good outcome for us. And um, there's been a lot of inflation around um, commodities like steel and energy and other input costs in terms of um, your construction costs. Has that made a, an impact on, on construction costs? Yeah, look, we, we are obviously redoing all those um, engineering um, with Clough at the, at the minute. Um, and, you know, there's probably swings and roundabouts on that. You know, what I mentioned earlier is, there's a whole lot of uh, efficiencies we're going to get out of putting that down at the site. Um, and obviously, you know, the last time we reported a uh, feasibility was, I think, 2019. So we'll have to see if there's any um, movement in those costs. Um, but overall, we expect actually to be in a pretty good position. I mean, there is a question here. Will there be a new feasibility study? Uh, so there's going to be updated numbers, you know, uh, released in due course. Uh, obviously, we need that for financing. Yep. Okay, and a few more questions here. What, what, what is a realistic timetable for all the approvals, in, including CLC? Yeah, so 
have to be a bit careful about what we've released the ASX here. The last thing we released is that um, the EPA had given us a sort of a within 12 month kind of uh, a guideline and to which we said, yes, we can meet that. Um, so I'll leave it at that, um, but obviously we'll be, we'll be firming up all that, that sort of the Gantt chart through to project development, um, you know, over the next while. And uh, a date for first production is, do you have something? <laughs> um, lots of questions here. Yeah, look, that's that's interesting. Um, you know, you might um, you might see we you, know, you mentioned that we had a research report done by Corporate Connect that um, actually I you know I'll plug you. I thought it was fantastic. Um, I thought they did a good job. Um, he's made some assumptions in there. Um, we haven't actually fully put out a new uh, first production date. So um, as I said, twelve months for the approvals, and um, uh, we we'll, sorry within twelve months for the approvals. Um, it's about as specific as we've been, and we will update it in marketing due course. 